If you would, turn your Bible to Acts chapter 16. That was just read. We're going to be talking about the events in Philippi as we continue our uh, study in the book of Acts. You know, you could, you could really call the book of Acts a study in, in the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we've seen how the Spirit of God was empowering the, the mission, the outreach of the church, how the Spirit of God was uh, bringing comfort uh, to the people as they suffered for their faith in Christ. And we're going to see all of that again today. The Spirit of God, don't you believe this? The Spirit of God is still with us today. And we, through His help, we can also be effective at sharing the gospel with people. And we also can find comfort when we're suffering for our faith. And so I hope as we, as we study through the book of Acts that you are excited and emboldened to share the good news with people that you come into contact with. And today in Acts 16, we'll see that the word of God is continuing to spread. It's spreading now even into Europe as we get into this chapter. And we're, gonna, we're on Paul's second missionary journey. So we looked at the Jerusalem Council last week in chapter 15. Now Paul and Silas are starting their second missionary journey. And uh, they pick up Timothy along the way. And they also pick up Luke. You'll notice in, in chapter 16 and verse 10, uh, we, we, we have been reading about they did this and they did that. But then in verse 10, we switch to we. We did this and we did that. And there's this subtle indicator that Luke has now joined uh, the party. And they come into the leading city of Macedonia in Philippi, and that's where we pick up the story in verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia. Lydia was probably a well-off woman. She was a seller of purple fabric, which was pretty rare and valuable. And she was a, apparently a seeker of God. And Paul, as is his habit, Paul goes to where the truth seekers might be gathered. And I think that's a takeaway for us from this lesson, that we need to take a, a page out of Paul's playbook and we need to go to where truth seekers might be gathered. Paul would go to the synagogues. Uh, here he's going to where he thought there would be a place of prayer. Uh, in Acts 17, we will see that he, in Athens, he goes to where the philosophers hung out. He's looking for truth seekers. And today, we can do the same. I know, I know that uh, when you find a good fishing hole, you're not supposed to tell where that is. Am I right, Joe? <laughs> but since we're fishing for men, I, I think it's okay. I'll share this with you. Uh, there's a coffee shop in downtown Granville that I go to uh, occasionally. And with some of you brothers, I've been there and we've had coffee. And as I've gone there, I look around and there are people all over the, the building. They're, they're studying their Bibles or they're having religious conversations. And uh, there's been times when I've been there uh, talking with a brother and somebody said, you know, I, don't, I didn't mean to overhear what you were saying, but I just wanted to say I really appreciate what you're talking about. And and uh, the other day I saw a young man in there who I've seen before who comes in and he reads his Bible and just an opportunity to strike up a conversation with people. And you say, I notice you've been here. I notice you've been reading your Bible. What are you reading about? What are you studying? He said, I'm, I'm in the book of Romans. And, well, that's a, that's a wonderful study. And 
I shared with what I was studying in Acts. And I think that's a really good way to reach people, to go where, where you know that people are searching for the truth. And is there somewhere like that in, in your life, somewhere where you can go to reach people, people that are searching? Maybe I'll see you at the coffee shop now that you know the, the secret. But it's also interesting here about Lydia that it says the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. It says that in verse 14. The Lord opened her heart. And I was thinking about this. How did the Lord do that? How, how does the Lord open hearts? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that. There's something supernatural going on that the Lord is doing. He opened up her heart, and, and no doubt the Spirit of God was at work here because Jesus had said, the Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so the Spirit, of course, played a role here, but I'm convinced that God still opens hearts today in those who are willing to be open. You see, it's not that Lydia didn't have a choice in the matter. It wasn't that God overruled her free will or anything like that. But she was somebody who was searching, seeking God. She was at the place of prayer, and God did something to open her heart that the Word of God might go deeply into it. Do you think that God still does that today? You know, every time before I preach or teach, I pray that God would open your hearts and my heart as well. I think that's a very powerful prayer. It's, it's a prayer that's right in line with the, word of the, the will of God because he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And I, I pray that God would open our hearts, that his word would go deeply into us. I wonder if you would join me in that prayer on the Lord's Day or when we gather for class. Pray that hearts would be opened to receive the message. And that goes for all of us, not just those who are outside of Christ. We all need open hearts, don't we, to hear the message. And if you see a visitor come in, somebody that might be from the community, that's a time for us. I, I hope that you'll join me just silently. You don't have to say anything, but to pray for that person that the Lord would open their heart. It's the word of God that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so for a heart that's opened, it will go down into it. And it's the word of God that creates faith in people. So we need to be praying that people will be responsive. And Lydia, she did respond. Notice that, that language. She responded to the word that was spoken by Paul. Salvation is a gift, but it's a gift that requires a response. The word of God proclaimed it always demands a response. And that, again, for those who are in Christ... You and I are those who are not. It always demands a response. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with the message preached? It's not enough to simply hear. We have to respond in faith and make moves toward God. The Word of God demands a response. What do you do week in and week out? as you hear the word of God proclaimed, are you responding to it? Lydia responded, and you see her response in, in verse 15. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia was baptized. That was her response. And why did she do that? What, did she think of this all on her own? Well, I think I should, I should better be baptized. Well, no, it was part of the message that was preached to Lydia. It was part of, of explaining faith in Jesus Christ. And it's just as Peter preached in chapter 2 
to those who were gathered, that they needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was part of the message. Lydia heard it, her heart was open, and she responded to that message. We've seen this throughout the book of Acts. And I keep, I keep hitting it and hitting it again as we go through Acts because there's so much false teaching in the world about baptism. That's not really important. It's kind of optional. It's not something you really need to do. Over and over again in Acts, we see that it's, it's an integral part of faith. And we see it here again with Lydia. And so Lydia and her whole household responded in faith. They believed in Jesus. Part of that was being baptized into Jesus. And so we need to be praying for people. Pray for those that you know. Pray for those in your family that God would open their hearts as well. And so things started out very well in Philippi. Things were off to a great start, but then there was this dramatic turn of events. We have the conversion of Lydia, but then we see that Paul and Silas were imprisoned in Philippi. Now, how did that happen? As they were going back and forth to the place of prayer, there was a, a servant girl who had a spirit of divination, the word says, and she was able to in some way predict the future through this demonic influence. And she keeps following Paul and Silas, Timothy, Luke. She keeps following them and shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. They're, they've come to t tell you the way of salvation. And she's shouting it over and over again. And Paul finally, the, the Bible says, gets greatly annoyed. And he casts the demon out of her. But that caused a big problem because this, this servant girl, she was probably a young woman, her, her masters were making a lot of money off of her. And so they were not happy when Paul cast this demon out. And so they stir up the whole city. They bring Paul and Silas before the magistrates and the city is in an uproar. There's kind of a riot starting. And the magistrates are, are very angry, and they say, beat these men with rods. And they beat them severely. And they threw them into prison, not just into the prison, but into the inner prison. They fastened their feet in the stocks. Now put yourself in Paul and Silas's shoes. What are you thinking at that moment? What are you feeling? Shackled in a dark dirty dungeon, bruised and bloodied, hurting from the beating that you've received, angry that you didn't even get a trial, as was Paul's right as a Roman citizen. What might you be thinking? Why is this happening to me? Why did God allow this? Why, why didn't God stop this? And maybe you and I would be very discouraged and thinking about giving up. But we read in verse 25, look at verse 25, a powerful verse. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They're praying. They're singing hymns of praise to God in this, what must have been one of the, the hardest moments in their lives. They're praising God. And there's a, there's a lesson for us in this, of course. That when we face trials, we need to praise God. We need to come to God. You see, too often people, when they face trials and, and hardship in life, they end up turning away from God. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. We need to, to come to God, to praise God, to pray to Him. 
even in times of great trouble. Turn your heart to him more than you ever have before. Draw near to God. But it's so easy for us to to dwell on the problems, to let fear become the Lord of our heart, to, to, to fret about things when they happen. I know, I, I've been there, and I've done it too. But what do we learn from Paul and Silas? Praise God, even in the darkest moments of life. Find all the reasons to be thankful to God. And there are many, aren't there? Even in the dark times, find reasons to be thankful to God. Think about all of the marvelous things he has done in your life and praise him, thank him, and and come and lay your anxieties at his feet and your your doubts and your fears and, and come to him. Don't move away from him. Come close to him. Trust him. Trust in his plans, even if you don't understand them. And wait for his deliverance. And know that people may be watching, people may be listening. And that's really where the rubber meets the road as a Christian, isn't it? And that's really where people can see Christ in us when they see our reaction in difficulty. And as Paul and Silas are in prison, they're singing and praying and the prisoners are listening. What kind of effect do you think that had on them? And as they're singing and as they're praying, it's about midnight, and there's a great earthquake, and and the shackles of all the prisoners are, are loosened miraculously by God. And the, the jailer wakes up, who's supposed to be guarding these men very closely, and he sees the earthquake and the gates open and the shackles are off and being a, a Roman soldier and following the Roman code, knowing the punishment that he's going to receive for letting the prisoners escape, he draws his sword and he's about to end his own life. And Paul cries out to him, don't harm yourself, we're all here, just before he ends his life. And the jailer, look at verse 28. The jailer asked a very important question. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? That is the most important question that anyone could ever ask. What must I do to be saved? And why did he ask this? Well, he probably heard of what this slave girl was calling out. These are servants of the Most High God. They're proclaiming the way of salvation. He probably saw the demeanor of Paul and Silas. He probably saw their genuine faith. And that's that's not normal, is it? To see someone going through that kind of pain and suffering, but to hear them singing praises to God? It must have been quite perplexing to this jailer. But it got his attention. And so he asked, what must I do to be saved? And here is the answer in verse 31. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Isn't that good news? Is there any sweeter news than that? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Well, surely there must be some kind of magnificent feat that I must accomplish. There must be some great a high-level act of righteousness that I could do to prove myself to God and to earn my way into His favor? Surely there's something, but here's the answer. Believe. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
but what does that mean? The jailer wouldn't have known much about Jesus, probably. And so we see in the next verse, verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. They spoke the word of the Lord to him. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? To put your faith in Jesus. That had to be explained. And so they spoke the word of the Lord to him. What what do you think they, they spoke about to the jailer? Well, the life of Jesus, the great miracles that he performed, the way that he went about helping and loving people. Uh, they, they no doubt spoke about the death of Jesus on the cross and what that means and the resurrection of Jesus, his great power to save. And how to receive his offer of salvation by faith about living a life for Jesus in faith. And what was part of that message that was preached about believing in Jesus? Well, look at verse 33. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. (laughs) Again, why was he baptized? He wouldn't have known anything about that. Because that's part of the message that was preached. And it was an urgent message. Faith in Jesus, part of that response to him, once again, is putting on Jesus in baptism. Being baptized into his name for the forgiveness of sins. As we've seen throughout this book and throughout the New Testament. Being baptized in the name of Jesus. And they were immediately baptized. Uh, They didn't wait till morning to be baptized. Once they were convinced that Jesus is the Christ, that he is Lord and he is Savior, they didn't delay. Why not wait till morning? It would have been a lot easier. No, this is too important. This is urgent. And so they went that very hour of the night and were baptized. And when a person understands what baptism is for, they won't wait very long. Now, it takes time, a lot of times, to study with people, for people to be able to think about what they're committing to and what it all means, and, and uh, that takes time. But then there shouldn't be a long delay. It shouldn't be, well, you know, maybe next quarter we'll get around to a baptismal service. It was, it was urgent. You see it with Lydia. It was urgent. You see it in Acts chapter 2, the same very day they were baptized into Christ. You see it with the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Look, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? It's, it's a matter of urgency because it's a matter of salvation. It's a matter of the sins being washed away. We see it with Saul when Ananias told him what he must do. He didn't delay, but he put on Christ in baptism. And the jailer, as we read, look at verse 34. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. You see, there was great rejoicing with the jailer and with his whole family. They had found salvation. They'd been saved. Their sins had been washed away. And there's great rejoicing And I wonder today if there's anyone here who would like to put on Christ in baptism. I hope that your heart has been opened this morning to hear the word of the Lord or to hear it again, as the case may be. And I hope that some of you are asking yourselves this morning the very question that the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. In everything that that means, believe in him. The answer is the same as it has been for the past 2,000 years. Believe in the Lord Jesus. That means putting your personal trust in him as your savior, as the one who died for your sins. That means resolving to turn away from your sins, to live a life for God as your Lord and as your savior. That means confessing Jesus as your Lord and savior 
and responding in faith to be immersed in his name for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you can be saved and you can go on your way today rejoicing greatly. If we can help you with that, we would love to do so. And if there's anyone here that needs prayers uh, for any reason, we'd be happy to pray with you. Feel free to come now, but also at any time and let us know. Let's stand together now and let's sing.